Um, and certainly I am um, a descendant of Elaine's work in Intermedia <laughs> and thought of her many times while I was making this. Do it as a live performance with the film? We've done it 20 times. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, and it's almost impossible to put on anymore oh. because it was so difficult. I know, I don't know if I'll ever do it again. Mm -hmm. I hope I will, but it's going to be expensive. Ec economics, again, very expensive to do it. It was just a miracle. Mm -hmm. Something, ha again, it was the necessity of doing it. But I think I've run out of my time, haven't I? Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, you know, um, if we have time later, I did bring with myself Chuck Workman's editing of 100 years of, of history and ending with one of the Lowy Fuller dances. I, do, I did bring that with me, so if, if... Is that a tape? Yeah, it's on tape, if you want to see it. Butterflies, it's just quite extraordinary, if we have time, or if you want to look at it outside. Thank you. That was great. Um, we're running late, so, and we need a little break before the next panel, so uh, let's, I guess we'll start at quarter to four. Okay, that's 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists. I was waiting a little bit for people to come up. I think they're still eating and drinking. But I guess I'll start anyway. And I was going to make an announcement to everybody, and maybe those of you that are here can pass the word along to other people that if there's not enough time for you to get back to your hotel to eat and come back for the screenings, there's a number of restaurants that are very, very close here, right across the street, more or less, um, to eat at, that you could just simply go to eat and then come back. Um, and if you ask any one of us, uh, we'll, we'll tell you where those are. But there's a good Chinese restaurant, and I think there's a, an Indian restaurant, or Italian? Italian restaurant. Oh, yes, State Street. There's pretty much everything. Greek, Scottish. Okay. So um, we're going to give the panel the full time. So this, this panel will end at, at 6 o'clock. And this is, uh, what is, what's the name of the panel? Uh, the Director Dialectic. The Choreographer Director Dialectic. <laughs> huh? Who thought of that? The shuttles? Yeah, probably. We're screwed. Everything's falling apart. <laughs> I tried so hard. You're doing great, Doug. I must tell you. Okay, so the, the choreographer, director, dialectic. <laughs> Elliot, Laura, Ami, Sylvina, Chaping, um, and Ami will begin. Yeah. Do you want me to begin now? No. In Swedish? Yeah. Do you hear me all right? Yeah, okay. The first time I met the word video dance was in 1994 when I attended a seminar in Stockholm and it was organized by Tiere och Dens i Norden, that means theater and dance in the Nordic countries. And they had this seminar because they wanted to um, make people do dance film and video dance in Sweden because we didn't do that very much. And the speakers were Charles Atlas that I think you are familiar with, those of you who don't know him. He was the one who, who made a Blue Studio with Merce Cunningham. And he also, um, one of his later works is a documentary, Hail the New Puritan, on Michael Clark. And uh, the other speakers were Walter Verdun from Belgium. And he usually works with uh, Anna Theresa de Kersmacher and uh, Wim van der Kebus, among others. And there was also Wiebeke Vogel, um, uh, independent video artist in Copenhagen. Um, well, this was the first time I really understood that this was something existing and interesting and breathtaking. Um, and Charles Atlas said that video dance happens when dancers and filmmakers make friends. So I realized if I was going to do this, I had to start make new connections. So I wrote an article on this seminar for the Swedish dance magazine and I copied it and I wrote a letter to the two film schools in Gothenburg, Sweden, where I live. And I had then an answer from, for, from two 
film photographers, Joel Olsson and Laila Östlund. And um, we met and they came to the house I used to live in. It was a hundred year old house that was hardly renovated. And uh, I was jumping in the attic in, this, in the cellar and they tried to follow me. And then we sat down and had tea and buns and they said, sorry Ami, we can't make a video dance out of this. This building cries for film, black and white film. So that's how uh, I just made a dance film. <laughs> the next time we met, we were already shooting. And uh, I'm happy to tell you this, that I, I had free film from Kodak because I wrote the synopsis of my ideas and a letter, uh, do you say, by hand? Yeah, and the director of Kodak, it never happened to him, so he was very moved by that. <laughs> That's why he gave me free film. Um, yeah, so now I guess I should show you excerpts from this, my very debut. Yes, uh, and I had to experience the video medium after, so I, because I started on film. And it's called Miss Two, Star Her Beloved and the Bald Quasimodo. And cut. Well, so some people when they saw this film, they said they couldn't call it a dance film because there was too little dance in it. But then there was some choreographer, an older choreographer, who told me that if a film is initiated by a choreographer and the actors in it are dancers, it must be a dance film. 
no matter how little the dancers move. So I guess the identity of a uh, uh, dance on camera piece can be confusing. Uh, performing dance on stage is so much built on sharing the same physical presence as the audience. When I go out on stage, I really sense the audience physically. I hear them and I can almost see them. Uh, they hear my breath, the sound of my movements. I know exactly where they are. They never, or should I say, hopefully, move. So um, I can trust them. I have my space uh, in which I move, and they have their space in which they don't move. Uh, so when I suddenly share my physical presence with the camera, it's a totally new experience. It's a little bit like going back in the rehearsal studio. I feel very naked, um, more insecure and more exposed than on stage. The lamps are much stronger and closer, which makes me lose energy a lot faster than on stage. Um, and the audience, I mean the film team, uh, are so much closer and they are not there to share my movements but to, to have them in focus and follow them. So uh, I often feel a need to be encouraged. I feel like this child in the crowded train station. Hello, here I am. Can you see me? Um, how am I doing? But since I chose uh, to be the director myself, I, I am the one who is responsible. There's nobody I can ask. I just have to pretend I know what I'm doing. Um, so there is so much focus on the lamps and on the camera, on the dollies, on the lights, and the dance itself is almost forgotten. And this also comes together with having to fake the movements, maybe hold them back to stay in frame or slow down to help the photographer. And the studio might be too small, but it was the only one you could afford. The dance is seldom chronologically filmed. You plan the takes according to the suitable light conditions to avoid too much moving around with the camera. So then you move around with the dance instead. Um, and of course, uh, the availab availability of the locations. And it can be confusing, but it's something that I got used to. And I have to tell myself a million times uh, that this one minute that we recorded for a whole day is not the usual performance now that will always disappear. It is something we did for eternity. It's a forever frozen, embalmed now. Uh, one big difference is also the language you use when um, working together with a film team. Things I would say when I made my second film, The Dancer, A Fairy Tale, were clearly understood by the dancers and the actors, and I did not have to change my language when speaking to them. When talking to the film team, I felt my words weren't really understood. I had to leave out words on visions, emotions, and just talk about something very concrete, as where to put the camera, um, if I wanted close up or long shot, uh, if I had any ideas about the light. So that was the language to use, very efficient and precise because that's what technique is about. Um, and I guess one could exaggerate this confusion between technique and performance with the, this following dialogue. So the dancer would tell the filmmaker, oh, I want you to make me fly on screen. Can you, can you make me fly? And then the photographer, on the other hand, could ask the dancer, I want you to fly. Could you please stop in the air while jumping so I can have a beautiful picture? So, <laughs> um, Of course, you work with technique in the theater as well. But in big theaters, there is very little contact between actors, dancers, and technicians. And the lamps are very high up, very far away. And there is no risk of dancing into a burning lamp. And um, in small theaters, dancers carry lamps themselves and build their own stage. So there never is a language problem, maybe more back problems. <laughs> so why do I then make dance for camera? Uh, first of all, I live in a quite small country where I often feel that uh, contemporary dance doesn't really work. The audience isn't there, the, the critics doesn't understand, don't understand us. They always love the opera ballets and the big shows, but they are very confused by our little black performance boxes. And I mean, the black performance boxes are the spaces for contemporary art, contemporary dance, contemporary music and theater. And this is something we know through history because 
maybe contemporary art will always have its attention uh, 10 up to 50 years after it was produced, if then. Uh, so I guess this is not typical for Sweden. I think it happens little by little everywhere. So I wanted to reach a different audience, even different critics. Um, I wanted to get out. I wanted to make dance for different rooms, already existing rooms, outdoor rooms. And I wanted to challenge the traditional narrative uh, film, uh, the system that rules the film world. Um, it turned out to be a tough task. Uh, I guess I would say it didn't work either. But I finally produced my second film. And it may come out in the world and meet people in the same situation, broaden my view, and maybe feel less frustrated. <laughs> so um, now I'm going to show you a solo, an excerpt from this second film, The Dancer of Fairy Tale. And I can tell you that I saw this solo being performed by uh, the young dancer Olof Persson. And I liked it very much, and I wanted it to be a part of my film. And I knew I couldn't use all of his movements. So, uh, this is what I said to him. I told him where and how to start, and that was one take, and then to run with the running photographer after him. Uh, that was also one take. And then to slide into the frame. That was two different takes. And then continue parts of his choreography. That was two takes. And then run to the two spots where we had the ending. So that was another two takes. And everything is filmed um, on, with Handicam by photographer Ewell Olsson, and the music is by Palle Dahlstedt and Toste Dahlstedt. So, okay. And cat. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is pretty fantastic. I'm able to show you something that's not from where you are. This is my hometown, Gothenburg, and this is Olof Persson who works there. Um, Olof felt very tired and dirty after these takes, but it doesn't show on screen. And um, by the way, I asked the dancer Juan Cruz Diaz de Garayo Esnaola. Do you know him? Do you know him? Uh, he is the one who plays this part as Superman in Deviates Enter Achilles. He works with Sasha Waltz now. Well, I asked what he thought by uh, the making of the video dance of um, this stage performance, Enter Achilles. And he said it was so, such hard work, so tiring, so much more exhausting that, than the performance itself. But when he now looks at the video, he is very happy and satisfied he, they managed to do it. And I'm happy too because I, didn't, I, I was able to see this beautiful work and I didn't have to take the plane to London. So, 
Uh, I had the opportunity to study video art for one year at the School of Fine Arts at the Gothenburg University. And then I became more familiar with the camera, mostly Super VHS, to tell you the truth. And I also learned the, the AVID, the non-liner, is it called liner video editing? Yeah. So then I just did some experiments with just me and the camera, very, very simple. No camera persons, no lights, just out of focus and me, improvising characters, movements in different locations. So most of the time I used only one front. I mean, I focused into the camera on the tripod. And then I edited this material, realizing how much could be done in the editing. Since it was based on improvisation, I didn't have to think of keeping an original choreography the same, but I could create new choreographies um, just by using different layers, different time and motion, simply do what is, is impossible on stage. So I, I could become two, even three. I could make a do it with myself, become trans transparent, move slower. So I'm just going to, to show you uh, this, I, I'm going to call it etudes. And the first one is a dream to be warm. And I think it's typical of the <laughs> dancer's video. It's based on warm-up movements. So. Mm. Okay, I think we had enough. And then it goes on and on and on. And then another etude from uh, Anna, Hedda, Margit and Judith, four women, just to show you, you know, one single shot and um, editing them together. Oh, that's the wrong one. That's the last one. Take the other cassette. Did I put them in the wrong order? Maybe. 
There must be one more. Yeah. The one with the, with the ugly envelope, I think. No, with a picture. No. Or maybe. Yeah, OK. OK, maybe I've, I forgot to bring it then, maybe. OK, so we're not going to see Anna Hedda. We're seeing um, another etude called Bird, Fish, or Woman. But th this time, I actually had some a person filming me. But it was very fast done. And uh, I wanted to explore the, the, the blue studio, the blue screen. So uh, and this is, this is a choreography that I performed. So it's not improvisation. So we can Oh. <laughs> And cut. So, and there are some things you can only do for the camera. For example, a choreography for the face. Well, these are just some of my thoughts on dance on camera. Of course, a very personal point of view. A lot more needs to be said and done, because where I come from, many people still say that this is something that can't be done, because there's no money in it. And that's such a tragic point of view. And I think we should change that, if possible. Thank you. It's with humility and great pleasure that I sit here before you today in the company of these stellar, talented individuals. My personal experiences have been mostly in making low-budget video dance. I have been making choreography for nearly 20 years, as far as I can remember. But as for video dance, this is within the last 10 years. I can still count on one hand how many works that I've made in this genre. Unlike some of my esteemed colleagues here who may be able to offer you the insight on what it's like to make work with medium to large budgets or to work with film, I can instead tell you what it's like to lug around beta cams, light kits, shooting in the snow, bartering with friends for their services. I provide you today with my heartily undisciplined thoughts on dancing before the camera, as I know it. 
Dance like life theater or performance art is an ephemeral art form only existing in action, in the accretion of performed gestures, and as an event or a happening witnessed unfolding, then remembered. Like so many things remembered, the memory itself is entirely dependent on the individual who was engaged in the process. Any, many, or all of one's sensory perceptions, their faculties for receiving knowledge, and abilities to create meaning of the experience may collaborate in this process. In a temporal art form like dance, the viewer, reader, must move through time with the dancer to imprint into their memory the impressions of the dance unfolding. What lasts is an imprint in the memory of the viewer. Dance, in other words, has no object form. We all know that. It does not exist separately or outside of the dancers who are needed to make it happen. The legacy of dance as a performed art is this. Purely speaking, it exists only in the living present. A drawing is but a static rendering of a non-static form. A photograph is a still 2D moment, albeit possibly a fairly good representation of it. A written description relies on linguistic translation. How well can such media convey a sense of time, space, energy, or the poetry uniquely portrayed in motion? In early books, one finds words marked out, marked out, mark, sorry, marked or crossed out as opposed to erased. These days, the use of the delete keystroke can magically and easily make things disappear. Dance performances are much like the early books. One is careful from the onset, from the initial act of mark making to take well prepared steps. You cannot repair your mistakes. This is why I've why live performance is the domain of the lion-hearted and the thrill-seeker. It takes a similar kind of risk, boldness, and self-confidence to do crossword puzzles in pen. Anybody out here? <laughs> in a dance performance like one's karma, only one's future actions can correct or act as payment of past ones. In a live performance, time marches on. Uh, jump ahead. Video has become the widely used answer to our prayers. It's comparatively cheap, especially since many people own their own consumer level equipment. Video as used for documentation purposes can be troublesome. On one hand, it is a speedy way to capture the spatial temporal qualities of dance. On the other, it's a 2D representation of a 3D form. Also, once the dance is captured on tape, it doesn't change. The specific performance of the dance is preserved or embalmed. I liked that description as well. Um, including all the flaws of the individual dancer's ex execution of movements at the moment. Case in point, if someone forgets the choreography or blanks out during a videotaping, will future performers repeat this improvisation of the original choreography? This is one of the outs of live performance. You can improve your future performances. With video, time is suspended, as is a particular performance. Choreographers and dancers use video to document their rehearsals, as well as performances, which I think affects the choreographic process itself. Long after the dancers have left the studio, the choreographer can review the videotape and continue to work on their choreography without the dancers there. Depending on the choreographer's personal process, this may be an advantage. If the camera is set up in the studio properly, it doesn't miss much. And as an unobtrusive observer documenting something improvised, even these chance maneuvers can be recreated. On the other hand, I wonder if we still dig as deeply to find the true essence of our materials as we once did without the advantage of a video camera. Maybe the movements that are remembered without the captive eye of the video camera are those that should survive the choreographic process and remain in the work. 
An alternative site for per dance performance is the hybrid form of video and dance known as video dance or um, cine dance, screen dance. And I was just thinking about maybe dancing before the camera as opposed to for the camera. Video dance refer refers to the work made for the camera using the contemporary medium and practices of video technology. It also refers to the art of creating a choreography for the camera to be viewed as a fully formed autonomous work of art, ultimately either on a film screen or television. It's certainly not a documentation of a dance and definitely not live performance, but rather a hybrid form, while also giving dance an object form of existence. In order to recapture the sense of intimacy and presentness lost in translating the dance to this medium, video artists need to address those qualities of video that make it so. Camera position, for instance, framing and editing are become the theater of video dance. I think video dance is an exciting hybrid of these two forms, bringing together body and motion as subject with the unique capacity of an electronic two-dimensional medium. In 1991, I created and performed a 40-minute solo work titled Yellow River, which was shown as part of the San Francisco Mozart and his Time Festival held at Theodore Artaud. I felt a deep creative urge to make a an autobiographical work which, which um, helped me explore growing up Chinese in America. This work combines movement and spoken, spoken text housed within a theatrical context composed of uncooked rice, glass blocks, barren tree branches, rice sacks, red paper, Chinese blessings, a large dictionary, and a metal wash tub. In the performance, I recount the stories, superstitions, and fables my mother told me while balancing these with scientifically grounded truths. And uh, if you could show a little bit of that, AJ.
1992, Douglas Rosenberg and I made Yellow River Huang Ho, a 17-minute video dance based on the 40-minute solo. In this scenario, since the choreography was already a complete whole, a work in itself, our challenge was to translate this work to video. In other words, there already existed a theme, a style, a structure. There already was a there, there. Using the uniqueness of this medium, we made use of slow motion, concrete, live sound, close-up shots, dissolved transitions, and text crawling or scrolling. Although I was still the choreographer and dancer, he was, and he was the director and camera person, we both edited the final work together. Can you show that? Likewise, we edited Delo, the next piece I'll show you, together in 1996. This time, however, we set out to make a dance that would exist only 
on camera. Although I came in with some movement material, which I'll also show you, it was only that material, not an entire choreography. Therefore, this process was much more fluid, allowing us each to cross our traditional roles and to experiment much more. We were not making a translation of a work. This was the work. We explored ways of deconstructing the dancer and the dance and representing both for the camera and the viewer's eye, set in an old-fashioned pool, which would soon be demolished in this very building. We made use of an inherent quality of the space, its sound. The site of this site-specific work is not only the pool in which we worked, but the video. Can you show uh, the first, yeah. So that was the movement material. Can you now, sorry, you don't need the lights. Just throw in the other tape, thanks. That was a solo called Pas Enfant. Um, it was commissioned by Symphony Space in New York. Um, music was Ravel.
So perhaps you recognize the movement material, but totally um, reconsidered and uh, contextualized in a different manner. Uh, so, my interest in the hybrid form of video dance or dancing for the camera is in the medium's ability to be free of the body and live separately from it, unlike dance, in direct contrast to the risk involved in live performance, which depends almost entirely on the individual's presence, fitness, and artistry. The videotape can exist and travel alone and be in the Netherlands or <laughs> Sweden or wherever. Um, the video medium offers challenges generally not found within the scope of live performance, challenges which include maintaining a sense of intimacy, emotionalism, and physicality. I'm excited by the possibilities of the body as can be expressed via camera, how it can reinvent the body or recorporealize it, mm -hmm. um, deconstruct it, so I guess decorporealize it, and frame it for the camera and then the viewer's eye. I suppose dance and technology is where the future of dance lies. On whatever level one participates, whether it's to pre preserve a work using video technology, creating a work using computer technology, or studying a work using all of the available resources, the future of dance will remain in the hands of those who can honor and be informed by the past while embracing the possibilities that the present and future brings us. Today, it seems that the way something is packaged has become much more important and what is actually inside. In other words, the logic is that if it looks good, then it is good. High production values and documentation has become disproportionate to the work. Of course, the documentation is useful and important as a means to preserve it, to show the work. However, we must remain rigorous in our approaches in making the work because the moral of the story is that in a world of seductive packaging and fancy gadgets, it is still quality that counts. Productivity for its own sake is waste. Let's keep this in mind in the 21st century. Okay. Yeah. Um, I thought I, I wouldn't do that question, but it seems like it's essential. Okay. Um, I'm Silvina Sperling. Um, I'm from Argentina, real down south, and it's summer there now. So, um, apart from the subject of this panel, I thought about bringing you some news and material from Argentina in general, as also Doug asked me. So, uh, okay, my English tends to go when I'm in front of so many people, so. Um, even though the subject of this panel is, oh, well, that I, I said already. Apparently, video dance is making a significant impression in, or entrance in the media in Argentina. The coverage of the last fifth festival in the last July by the Rhythm Press and TV is something that def definitively hadn't happened before at all. Uh, Mr. Elliot Kaplan can tell you how many times he has to, had to take care of TV producers and journalists. Uh, let me tell you a recent story that started December 23rd of the last century I got a phone call from a guy I know from the small circle of local video art. His name is Rodolfo Ramida, and he has done some outstanding programs for TV in the past, and I knew he was appointed to be in charge of the national PBS, Argentina Televisora Color. So notice the name of the channel. It introduced the color TV in the country in 1978, when the military dictatorship wanted to broadcast the soccer world championship just to hide all the blood that had run and the corpse they had thrown from their, their helicopters into the river. Anyway, 
I got a call from Rodolfo. Hey, Silvina, I'm working at ATC and would very much like to have you making a weekly show on video dance. But you have to be on the air in 10 days. Are you able to? What did I say? Sure, of course, sure. Okay, so that's the last news. Um, apart from the fact that I am feeding my narcissism each time that I see my face on the screen, the meaning of video dance considered, considered in itself an issue to be broadcasted sounds really strong to all of us who dedicate a significant amount of time and effort to build an art form which language is changing every day. And this leads me to the matter that joins us here, which is how is video dance built through the relationship between choreographers and directors? Or how is dance for the camera as a genre informed in each different relationship established in each piece of work? In my personal experience, after making my debut with the piece Temblor, Trembling, uh, in which I worked all by myself as choreographer and director, I began working with my youngest sister, Susanna Sperling, who is a dancer and choreographer. <coughs> that was actually at ADA in 94, under the advisory of Douglas Rosenberg. Needless to say, our relation is one of an extreme closeness, one of creative tension I personally enjoy, after crossing the bridge of taking everything personal. The choreographer usually wants to see what she imagined at the first meetings when the video is still on each person's fantasy. I've collaborated both in pieces specially made for the camera, multimedia pieces for the stage, and lately, a video restaging of her last piece commissioned by the Experimental Center of the Teatro Colón, which is Buenos Aires Opera House. The Experimental Center of the Opera House. So the piece is called Rivanji, the center of the dizziness. And it's, um, it's a long piece. And it's on music by Colin Lancaro and John Cage. And it turned into Sister Sister in its version for video dance. So uh, this piece is uh, an eight minute piece. And um, well, I'll, I, I think I'll show you part of it. So it's, it's part. <laughs> 